Hello again, folks, and welcome to the module number five of this workshop, Microsoft Azure Training, Management, and why not best practices and all the things we have been discussing we were covering these topics. This fifth module of the series, folks, is about the monitoring options of Azure and the Recovery Service Vault for backup and continuity. We already mentioned some of these things in other modules, but today, we will focus on that effort. Remember, my friends, my name is Arturo Hamilton. I'm here for you. We'll work together during this module, during the rest of our session, and well, I hope these topics. Nothing left to say in here, folks. Let's go, sit back, and enjoy this. For the first lesson of this module, folks, we are going to talk about Azure monitoring for resources and service. We know. And we have been the whole week creating objects, creating solutions, adding new objects, adding new services, configuring them, etc. But what about the proper functionality of them, right? How do we know that the services are working? How are we aware of something that might be failing? How do we actually secure our solutions? Well, the idea of this first topic of our module is to discuss that specific approach. The monitoring of resources. So let's take a look. The first thing that we have to know is that it exists a dedicated portal, portal for monitoring my solution. This is the Azure Monitor Portal. This portal, my friends, uses a lot of different options to monitor, one of them being the metrics that we have. Let's take a look here before we come back to the slide. In Azure, folks, if you configure it to have all the favorite resources, you will scroll down and you will look for the blue speedometer, the monitoring option. Here you have free and paid scenarios of an ion. We can monitor the applications, take a look in here, based on alerts, based on logs, and based on metrics. That's what we were mentioning in here. We can actually read the specific performance, check for a specific activity, or if we want trigger events not only alerts not only notifications trigger events based on an issue or an outage that we might be experiencing that's the whole objective of using this type of service as we were seeing here on the slide and also here on our portal screen we have the chance if we want of combining different characteristics for example we can have a metric to monitor the performance, the in and out traffic of a computer. And then we can trigger an alert whenever that traffic exceeds my expectation, right? That will be the standard approach of interpreting metrics. Let me show you here. If I go back to the portal and I click on the metrics, I have the chance of selecting check on this a scope object wait seconds there it goes and we have the chance in here of selecting the subscription that we want that's the whole core of my monitor for to select the proper scopes don't worry we're going to go back to that specific approach but this service folks is about that about checking actual service the actual detailed resource that we need don't get me wrong we can create this a hundred a thousand times for all the other services for all the other solutions that we have one at the time we will be able of showing this information you have a subscription a resource a tenant a user an actual source for example if you remember in one of the previous models we talked about custom hybrid networks well, you can connect that hybrid network and analyze the traffic in Azure. That's a scenario of something we That's the idea of the monitoring services. You can react or you can prevent. You can respond in real time. You can automate the response. You can use this to integrate and optimize your solution. That's the whole objective of our Azure monitoring service. When we talk about the monitor service, folks, remember it's quite important to, to have in mind and remember that there are a lot of data tiers that we can use to collect our information 
data collection set, data collection analysis. For example, you may be monitoring an application. An application might report back the number of petitions, the number of transactions, the drop connections. It might also report, for example, the time of response, the time that takes for the application to answer back to a service that is requesting an access, that is requesting a piece of information that is processed by the application. We might be talking about the guest operating system monitoring. It's not the same monitoring the performance of a virtual machine, the traffic of the network of the virtual machine, that monitoring the actual computer, the activity that takes place. Someone installed this, someone executed this, someone delete or update this. That can be done with a guest operating system. We can monitor, for example, as with the whole purpose of controlling the budget managing the prices, and always having like a complete overview of the cost of my services, you can use a subscription monitoring. And that's not all. You can monitor the users, the accesses, the services running on that subscription. You can go to the tenant and check the identity. You can go to the tenant and check the login attempts, the elevated permissions, the secured or the exposed for security breaches user accounts. All these type of variables are part of the data collection set. There are so many that we will need maybe a complete week just to explain them all, how they work, what you can get. What I need you to get from these specific slide folks before we get into the it's the actual understanding of the options are enormous. You are not limited to monitor something like pretty specific without visibility of all the other factors that you may consider relevant, okay? We can achieve that with the monitoring service. But let's take a look on the service now. If we go back to the portal, before we go back to the metrics that I'm, I was showing to talk about the scopes, there is something I need you to see. Below the overview, folks, we have the activity log. The activity log, folks, will show every single action that has been executed or has taken place the subscription at the platform level hear me out platform level my friend this means that you can come here check for the subscription see what's happening and see if someone created modify rename delete reallocate move etc on the platform in here you won't see someone installing something a virtual machine, someone running a query inside of a database. No, this is about the platform. You can see here, the allocate virtual machine, a computer got stopped. You can scroll down here, for example, all the things we have been doing today, and you can check the update. Start it, update, and delete. These are options that we have. The time span that we have, folks, and this is an important thing, for free, it's 30 days. And you hear me right. It's for Free. You don't pay for this monitoring. If you open, for example, the deallocation, you have the details, summary, the execution, and the details on a JSON file. This JSON file will see what happened, the allocate action. It was an operation, the management of Azure on the subscription. You can see here the details of the ID event. You can see the virtual machine deallocated, the resource group and the computer, etc. So if you want to check what happened, you always have it for free. Remember, only the last third port. Okay. If you want to have more than that, we're going to use a paid solution called the Log Analytics Workspace. Talk about that in a second. Well, not in a second, a few minutes. But just for you to have some context, this will be our first approach. Now, we can download this as a report. We can create an alert based on a specific piece of traffic running here, or a specific activity running here. But if I want to have that extended history, or I want to have the details of the services, like I said, something on an operating system, something on a database, this is not our service, okay? This is like the starting point. The next thing that we have, and that's something we were discussing a few seconds ago, are the metrics, okay? The metrics, folks, will show us performance indicator, a numeric value that represents a specific point in time on performance. Check this. 
I can go here, and this is the best of all. I can go to the metrics. I can go and say, you can see a pop-up will be triggered in here. Second, there we are. Once we have that pop-up, well, it's like thinking if he wants to pop up. <laughs> well, on the pop-up, we can select the target. As I was mentioning, we can go to a specific detail level, like a subscription. Check this. I'm going to go the subscription we have been using, the resource group we have been using this week, and we scroll down the virtual machine that we connected. I'm going to click Apply, and the scope will be in there. I'm going to read now all the data in via network. We can see here network inbound total. And we will have a graphic with the last six hours. Well, no, actually, this is. But you can see we had a peak when we connected earlier today using the bastion. I can switch this over or I can add another line. Give me a new metric chart in here. But now give me the outbound traffic. Down, outbound, uh, it's network outbound, network out total. And we have now two metrics, you see? Two options showing at the same time. If this is quite relevant for you, I can pin this to my dashboard. And I can go back to my dashboard on the top left. And you will see that metric chart available the moment you log Basher. This is an approach, you can see it's an approach of monitoring with the free tools. We're not doing anything advanced. We're not doing anything beyond the out of the box tools. You can see here, net in and out for my computer. These are options we have on the monitoring service. Okay, now from here, from the monitoring services, folks. I keep scrolling down We're on the metrics. You saw I have to select, right? My dashboard will have disappeared by now because I didn't save it anywhere else. And I'll have to start again by selecting my description. What if I told you that if you open the service you want to monitor, for example, the virtual machines, you will have a direct scope without filtering by subscription. I'm not going to use this one now. I'm going to use the one that I receive on my virtual machine. So now that my virtual machines are here, I can click on the demo, the VM we created for this workshop, and I can go to monitoring. I'll be able to use the metrics from there. The scope that we're trying to follow, take a look, it's actually, most of the times, pre-configured on the monitoring tab. You can see here, the key metrics of the last six hours are now available by default. We can pin this to the dashboard too and keep on monitoring directly from a funding perspective. You can see the same graphic we had. We can see here EU usage. You can see the disk operations. And you have everything included for free. These are the same metric indicators. We are using the exact same system stores. Nothing comes from a different location. So whatever you have in report one will also be available for two. Okay, so there is no, no advanced approach that you might not need to have uh, to configure a basic monitor. Again, there are a lot of scenarios where we might want to use something advanced, something different, and I'll show you that in a minute, but this is the standard approach for the metric management. So that's what we have now for the metrics. But if we talk back, about the objects that we have in our service, remember that we also have the logs, okay? The logs are based on the activities we were mentioning. Remember, the activity we have on the monitor, it's based on the platform. It's not based on anything extra, it's not based on the details of the services. The diagnostic settings and the exportable content of those settings has to be configured differently. This brings me back, we have here again, the activities we mentioned earlier today, this brings me back to the description of the data types. As we mentioned before, the data types can be a lot of different scenarios from a lot of different services. We took the time to explain some of this a few slides back, right? But what if I need to show you, for example, 
not the connections, but the actual security approach of monitoring my service. What if I have show on the front end all the objects that are being connected via external source management to my application? What if I need to show you operational management, specific reasons? Example, some of the changes at service level, like a new soft network added to a network, the change of an IP, not directly on the operation. It's important, folks, that we remember that all these scenarios are important to be evaluated beforehand. You have a proper consideration of the implications, the sizes, and what we want to see, because you may go and think, hey, Lock everything and we will figure it out. No. You will spend more money than needed. You will have a lot of logs that are not useful or meaningful. And at the end of the day, will obviously have an impact on the successful rate of this. So try to have the data types under control. Okay? Try to think about the data types as an approach that is needed, but always after a proper analysis of information. That will wrap up this topic now, the data type. If we keep pushing forward the different topics that we have for monitoring, there is another option that we have that it's called the alerts. As you can imagine, an alert can be triggered to do something after a specific action has been detected or to take an action after something has been detected. The alert, folks, can trigger a notification, but that's not all. Nowadays, the alerts are improved. An alert, my friends, can be triggered along with a notification or automation. What if the alert you are executing requires the usage, for example, of uh, cleaning a locked temporary database instance? Let's think about this option. You drop an alert, a mail to the database, data steward, but that person is on vacations, that person it's not available, that person forgot his or her mobile at home, and the user is not able to see the mail immediately. If we only trust on the notification, folks, the alert will actually break us down, right? Well, you can execute an alert and also execute a sequence like a PowerShell script, like a function, like a logic app, like a run book, like a playbook automation account with the objective of, okay, while well, you notify the user about the TempDB reaching the limit, also execute this query with these specific account permissions to drop the content of that database if it available as desired. This is the approach of the alerts folks. I mean, I'm going to show you this in a second, but the objective is to have always like a list of options to solve in case of an outage. The alert in Azure is optimized for that. When we work with alerts, folks, when we are dealing with this as part of our service, we need a scope, a condition, and an action. The scope is the object we are monitoring. The condition is the activity we're watching for. And the action will be the steps taken after the condition it's mad. Okay, let's take a look in here. Back to the portal. Here, we select the alerts. And the same that happened with the metrics is going to apply in here, folks. We're going to have to create a new rule. But I will prefer you to see this directly from the service we want to monitor. And then we will come back here. Double so, what if we want to monitor the virtual machine? every time it gets started or stopped let's open the virtual machine let's go here to the alerts under monitoring and let's create a new alert rule you can see the resource has been selected by default this is what i was talking about check the difference again monitor alerts new alert rule and you can see no resource is selected. Everything else is the same. The only thing that it differs from this is that here I can select anything on my subscription. And if I run the alert directly on the service, that's already on. Okay, so I'm going to keep it up. This one. 
So let's go for the alert. The next thing we need, it's the condition, remember? What are we looking for? I'm going to add, I can add metrics based on performance. For example, if the CPU threshold gets to 85% for more than five minutes, drop a notification or something like that. Well, in this case, that's not one, that's not what I want to do. But I want you to see it's an action. I can go here and instead of metrics, I'm going to grab the activity log. These are activities. And I'm going to select whenever the computer is started. You can see it started once today. I'll use this as the condition. The next thing is to add an action for that condition. So here, I'm going to create a new action group. The action group tools can include options, alerts as emails, alerts as notifications, and alerts based on an automation process, as I was mentioning, maybe something like a ROM book. You can go here, action group name, I can call action. This, add a notification. I'm going to send a notification to a role, the owner of this computer, or I can send a notification to a specific mail. I can go here and say demo mail at hot.com, for example. I don't have to have a mail on the domain for that, and I can drop it. My name, my demo mail, and I have to say as the actual. Here, demo mail, everything is ready, and we have now a notification. And as I was mentioning, along with the execution folk, I can also run a function, a webhook, a logic. I can select, for example, a specific run book and create from a run book a desired set configuration. I'm going to run stop the VM, select the subscription, and stop this VM as soon as it's. What I want is to keep this computer off because of a price, for example, because of a business scenario of saving configuration as well, and use this. Not going to work because I need to create a whole run book, but I can have the creation from the top. You don't have to add multiple sequences, okay? You have the chance, if you want, of executing just, for example, the notification without any other action. I can remove this one if I don't want to. I can add it later, no tax, and create my alert. Here goes the alert. I have now target, the condition, and an action. I need to save this as a whole. So this will be demo application alert. I'm going to demo. And now I have, I hit create, an actual alert for every time my computer starts. This is how an alert can become. In a few minutes, I'll have this alert available now. Under the rules, I'll be able to modify the actions if I want to do something different from the and everything will be now. This is my alert for. Now that I have the alert, I can go back to my monitoring portal, for example. I can select in here my solutions of Azure, go to the alerts that we had in here, and in a few minutes, I'll be able to see the alert as part of the rules. I can check here some of the rules we have created. We have the actions, the monitoring, etc. You can see here VM notification, demo notification alert. So we have some options that we actually use. This is the one we just created. I can open this and it's the one we were configuring a few minutes. This is, you can see, my other alert option. Now I can monitor and modify from here. I don't have to do it directly on my computer. At the end of the day, folks, what we're trying to do is to monitor these alerts. Okay? We have to keep an eye on the results and the services so we don't have something that might be out of the monitoring eye. And, well, the alert will be not useless, but will have an impact on my actual expected service level agreement, right? So based on the criteria and the configurations that we, we had here, we can make an alert to be always showing the information as close as possible to real time if we always come back and monitor the results of the alerts feed them as positive acknowledge closed 
false positive, etc. So the alert can actually improve the way it works using a little bit of learning algorithms to always show whatever is supposed to be shown and to try to reduce a little bit of the false positives. So as a summary of this topic, my friends, remember we created an action group, okay? The action group, it's where we had another specific type of outcomes for the trigger beyond the notification. As you can see, we had the run book where we can execute a specific PowerShell script, a sequence, a logic cap, etc. We have the function where we will execute based on an event, a specific part of code just with a single action. We can drop the email as we were seeing to our role, or we can send the email, the SMS of, or the push notification to any type of contact that exists. We have the option of using the IT service management product service, that it's basically a connection to a ticketer uh, functionality to create like an advanced management of it. We can execute a logic app that is a workflow with a list of steps and sequences to read the alert, create a solution, and drop it, or we can use a webhook. This is a real endpoint that exists on HTTP that will allow you to communicate with the service from any external system. So if the alert is supposed to re register something, for example, on an on-prem line of business ticketing solution, that can be done with a webhook. The alert triggers the hook, the hook calls the HTTP trigger, the endpoint is rich, and you register what you were trying to. These are the types of actions that we can implement. And this, my friends, the activity, let me go back here to the monitor, the activity, the alerts, and the metrics are the three services that we can use out of the box without extra service configuration or extra management directly on our monitoring board. There is another service that we can use to monitor advanced log activity. And that's not outside of our subscription or complicated compared with the things we have done. It's a different service we have to set up. I'll show you this in a second. Call the Log Analytics Workspace. Before we set up the Log Analytics Workspace, folks, let me give you some context about it. Log Analytics Workspace, it's a solution that we can use to centralize logs from different data sources. When I say different data sources, I mean in and outside of Azure. You can connect on-premises technologies. You can connect computers that you have on-prem. You can use System Center to integrate. You can connect virtual machines that exist in other cloud provider solutions. You can connect third-party cloud private solutions. You can connect all the Azure services that we have. The idea is to have a single point of logging for all the services to happen to exist where we need them. This is the Log Analytics workspace as a context. Once we have all the logs centralized, we have the chance and the option of executing monitoring based on uh, queries. You can go and read the content using queries and create advanced reporting whenever it's needed from the monitoring scope of the log analytics. So let's create here a log analytics workspace service. We're going to go here, log analytics workspace, workspace. You can see an option we have, and we're going to start by creating a new one. So not. There it goes. Subscription and resource group, as we have seen before. The name, Log Analytics Demo. My region. I'm going to sub delete. Demo 2021. That's new for sure. We have here our region. Let's put this on the East Coast. The pricing tier won't change for a standard subscription. When you have an enterprise agreement or an advanced paid subscription, you'll see different type of tiers. Just to give you some context, most of them will have a free five gigabytes transfer slash five gigabytes storage. When you exceed, not over past that, well, you'll have to pay more money, obviously, right? <laughs> so, well, that's just to give you some context. As you can see, nothing extra here. Go and create and create. While we wait for this one to be ready, I'm going to go to my virtual machine and I'm going to start it. 
because I'm going to connect my log analytics workspace to this virtual machine. So I need the computer to be running. While we wait, folks, an important FYI, a virtual machine can only be connected to one analytics workspace at the time. If we create a new one, we have to manually move the analytics workspace, the commission analytics workspace, and reconnect the computer to the new location. Okay, that's always going to be the case. So we have the workspace and we have the computer running, as you can see here. Let's go back to log analytics workspaces. Let's graph the one we created. And from the top, I'm going to connect a data source. Azure Bertle machine. I'm going to graph this one. You can see my production computer is already connected. I'm going to connect. Well, that's already there. I will need to deconnect it. This one is running and not connected, so I can use this one. Let's open this one. Click connect. As easy as that, all the usage indicators of the computer will be fit to my log analytics. That's the purpose of this type of service. Okay, it's going to take a while, but we'll be ready. We can connect some other stuff. Take a look in here. I can connect, for example, the activity logs. Remember I mentioned on the first lessons of this module that the activity log is free for 30 days? Well, check this. If I do this and I click connect, the activity log is now feeding the history of this log analytics. 30 days after the connection, the history will be now in here and I can consume it whenever I need it. That's what I was saying, that we can extend the durability whenever we need it without compromising the functionality of the free 30 days of activity that we have. We can also connect if we want, for example, you can see now that's connected. I can connect if I need to. Uh, advanced services, for example, storage accounts. I can use System Center to install the agent on on premises computers and make them talk to this analytics workspace. If the service is not in here, I can go the other way around and use something called the diagnostic login. This diagnostic login, folks, refers to the principle of reading and capturing the information of our log analytics workspace and putting everything that happens related to the service we are connecting. Most of the services, not all of them, but I will dare to say maybe nine out of 10 services in Azure has the capacity of logging diagnostics and feeding them into log analytics to centralize them. How do we know if it's compatible? Well, diagnostic logging folks will give you the chance of connecting any service out of our log analytics into it. Check this. For example, the Active Directory. I can go here to the Azure Active Directory. I can scroll down and look for the green book, Diagnostic Settings. I'm going to connect this in here. This is the one I need to use. I can use this one, one of those that already exists, for example, and change it. I can connect a different log analytics, just like this. You can see the log analytics is there and save it. And now I have all the features and transactions of this uh, Azure Active Directory being saved in the log analytics. If I open one of the networks we created today, check this. We created some networks for our networking module. I can go to Vnet. So here we will see that there are services that will show that green book and there are services that won't. An example of a service that won't show it, it's the SQL databases. In here, we do have it. Once I connect this, diagnostic settings, send me all the metrics and stuff, send me all these to the log analytics, and let's call this VNet Diagnostic Box. Save it. Just like that, my virtual network is also feeding my log analytics. As you can see, we have multiple options that we can use from this. Okay, the idea is to centralize, as I was mentioning, to retain the logs for future analysis, for trend analysis, for advanced analytics, for business intelligence. There are a lot of reasons to do. This is one of the things that we can do if we need to have a centralized experience. Now, when we go for that type of logging, we can configure it aside from the portal, or we can connect using PowerShell or another interface. 
these logs are now centralized on my Log Analytics workspace. From there, we can decide to have now business processes like automation, like monitoring, like alerts, and a lot of different scenarios now to read the content that I've been saving. Now that we have this, remember that we have all the automation. We can use external destinations to save the objects, external process, for example, an event hub, for example, a data factory connection that will read the logs and then you will create insights, business intelligence for the logs. This becomes more than a monitoring solution now, it becomes an intelligence tool that can be used to optimize the business processes. That's the idea of the diagnostics and the logs, folks. So as a best practice, the recommendation is that you will try to use this type of services whenever possible. Okay? So we have these logs now mapped and saved into the log analytics workspace. Let's take a look in here, just for you to see one of the options that we have. Let me go here to Log Analytics Workspace. Here. Now that we have configured these diagnostic settings that we had, remember, we are capable of sending all the information. This is the one from the computer. This is already connected. The moment we install the agent, you can also do it from the computer. But now that we have the objects connected, I can go here. This. Those. And I can go and check the services that I have mapped with an agent. For example, if I click on agent management, you will see that I have one computer selected as connection. You can see here, one computer connected. You remember we installed the agent into my computer a few minutes ago, right? I can click on go to logs. And guess what? We have a query platform that we can use for this type of analyzing of my content. This is called the Query Log Analyzer. It's actually quite similar to the Windows Query language, except that it's optimized to read log positions. As you can see here, we have a query called the heartbeat, operating system equals Windows. We have the source computer ID as an order table, sort by computer, and you can see here my computer. It got added source of the computer, the public IP we have, the name. It's a direct agent installation with Windows 10, this version of Windows 10, that uses all these characteristics. If you don't know how to use the language, you don't have to worry, folks. We have a lot of queries pre-configured for most of my services. I can go here and say, hey, show me, for example, the network. And I can check here requests per hour, security incidents. You can see all the incidents. Execute this one, and you can see it's connected in here. Okay, we have to confirm if there is an error or something. Like you can see, there might be missing something here, but we have the chance of executing a specific objects whenever we need it, if if the query exists by default. There are advanced queries that you can use from here, or you can create queries from scratch. Looking on the Explorer for pre-made templates or start directly from the top. General exploration, for example, all the computers with our most pickable content. And you can see here the heartbeat with one. Okay, these are, you can see there, scenarios that we get to manage. This query language, folks, is one of the best practices we have now to exploit the content that we have been saving in our log analytics. You can search, you can automate, you can create alerts on the results of the queries, and well, we have a fully automation experience ready to be used at the reach of our hand by the usage of log analytics. These folks are the monitoring options that Microsoft has for us when we use an Azure subscription. As you have seen, we have free options, paid options, standard options, advanced options like log analytics workspaces. The idea. It's to avoid losing any type of activity that might be considered critical for our subscription. I know there are scenarios where you might think, hey, this is not needed to be monitored. This is not something I deal with on a daily basis. And there are things that you might want to have an immediate response whenever it happens, right? Well, that's the core of this type of monitoring that we cover on our desk. Our next lesson and the final lesson of this module, it's about Backup and recovery. 
When we talk about backup and recovery, folks, it's important we remember there are a lot of different solutions for backups, okay? There are services that can be backup on their own, like the web applications we covered on the computing discussions, or there are services that will require a third-party service to back it up. For example, something called a recovery service vault. An Azure Backup Recovery Service Vault, folks, might be used, and it's common to find something like this solution, used to replace or to increase the effectiveness of an on-prem backup approach. Instead of having a standard, let's say, magnetic or drive backup on-prem, you use this type of extension to actually have the backup in a different region, even on a different state or country, if possible, to have the backup available in case of a disaster. That's a common approach of the backup. Azure Backup folks give us a list of components that we can use to get the most of it. For example, you can get backups uh, optimized for servers, optimized for SQL servers, optimized for SAP services. It depends on what you have, the type of backup that you will get. This idea of backing up specific services gives you control over the periods, over the shuttles, over the retention of each of the possible variables on the type of service that you're backing up. All the components we have in backup folks can be used if we decide to go for the third party service on the recovery services board. Let's see here. If we decide to use the recovery service vault, folks, it's important we remember there will be some backups and services that we will be capable of configuring by default and some services that will require an agent or a server to reach the desired endpoint, for example, a non-prem technology. This is an important approach because when we're backing up, for example, an Azure virtual machine, an agent of backups will also be required to be installed, the same as if we do it on-prem. Okay, you can keep your data completely secured. You can use advanced uh, automation of services to uh, schedule and retain for longer periods to execute multiple times. The idea of the recovery service vault, it's as I was mentioning before, to specialize based on the business needs. Okay, let's take a look here on how to create a recovery service vault. I'm gonna go here, recovery service vault. There it goes, and we're gonna click on add. The first thing we're going to create is just a standard recovery services vault, okay? So let's wait here a couple of seconds and we will add it. We're gonna add a resource group and a name. Recovery service vault demo. We're gonna put this on the post as we have done with most services. Tags, review and create. As you have seen, we are only creating a vault. The vault is not actually backing up itself. We need to configure uh, a shell policy. We can need to configure a retention policy. We need to map the services we will back up, etc. There are still some things to complete. So let's wait for it to be deployed and we'll be back here to customize our vault. We have the vault ready. I'm gonna go to the resource in here. You can see it's empty. I can click now backup and start configuring. I'm going to backup something in Azure, virtual machines, file shares, remember this from the storage discussions, or specialized workloads, a virtual machine. Backup. The policy, it's the periodicity, the frequency. How long are we retaining after that? You can see here. Retain the snapshot for two days, create this as custom policy, execute this daily or weekly at this time, this time zone, okay? Retain by default for 180 days, and then you can create some retention backup points at weeks, months, and even years. The whole option that we have here, it's about keeping a complete customized policy per service. That's what we need. We don't have to configure anything that goes in detail. That's not the case. I can go and say, this is my option. I can use a default one like we have here. Add a virtual machine. It's going to install the agent into the virtual machine. And once installed, we just have to enable the backup and we'll be good to go. 
as easy as this is to backup a computer. Now, I can go back, select again backup, but now backup a file share, a storage account optimized for file shares. I can select here my storage account, the one we created for the web application, and select the file share that might be created inside of it. And the same, a policy with the difference, check here, that the retention policy or the extended policy we have, it's only daily basis. On control of the computer, where we can back up daily and weekly, in here we can only back up daily. I'm gonna keep going. We have everything ready. And we have the two types of backups available to be. Once the backups are complete, folks, we can start getting reports. There are a lot of options that we can use to report. We need to connect, and you may be guessing now, to Log Analytics Workspace. I need to send the information to Log Analytics Workspace in order to actually have the logs ready to be monitored. So you can see all the things that will be sent, items, stats, recovery points, policy executed, alerts executed, and the same that we did, add diagnostic settings, add it to the Log Analytics Workspace, and once on the Log Analytics Workspace, as we were doing, just check the reports you need directly on the portal in here. Okay, so that's the objective, folks, of creating like advanced reports on our services. We can have another real application of the monitoring discussions we had on the previous days. So as you have seen in here, folks, there are a lot of things that we can back up. This type of recovery service Bolt has the approach of backing up virtual machines with Windows and Linux, of backing up on-prem devices using System Center Data Protection Manager, backing up direct Windows servers if you install the agent. You can back up, for example, storage accounts. You can back up specialized workloads like Subhana, like SQL, like Postgres, for example. You can see here different type of approaches that you can actually include on the backup scope hole. The Recovery Service Vault is not optimized for one type of solution, as you have seen. It can be used across different scenarios to keep them all together in a single backup location. Once we have the backups, folks, if we click here on backup items, sorry, backup items, you'll see a list of the different objects and the number of services running behind the backup agent, the backup service that you got. Okay, this is one of the options that we have. We also have the option of using the backup service vault for site recovery. Site recovery, folks, and this is our final lesson of the module, or the final topic of the module, is about providing business continuity by keeping the workload, the applications, the dependencies, the services available in cloud. So whenever there is an outage, you can switch your service, you can switch your application, you can switch your connections to the cloud endpoint. The site recovery can replicate on-prem to cloud, and whenever there is an outage on-prem, you can use the cloud solution to reach it. From a primary site perspective, folks, you can have a secondary site immediately available 30, 40, 1500 miles away from you. It's not like you will have them like directly available in front of you. This is a nice practice because in some scenarios, you might be into a volatile area, like maybe an earthquake area, a dry area, a floating area, or you might have to prove as a regulatory or compliance requirement that your services can be back up and extended to a different location in case of an outage. After the primary location comes back online, you can fall back to it, okay, roll back to the original position, or you can keep Azure now as the working production. Something important, just to wrap up this specific idea. In some scenarios, you can use this recovery service vault to migrate a workload. You execute the failover, you switch the operations to Azure, and you keep that working as expected now as a primary location. Do not hesitate on doing that if needed. That's also a pretty important option. 
Okay? Just a personal. And finally, my friends, we're almost done in here, but finally, we have the understanding of this site recovery as a global solution. You can back up in pair regions. For example, if your virtual machine is in the East US, you can back it up on the West US region. If your virtual machine is in Europe, you can back it up, for example, in Asia, in Africa, in America, any continent that you need, my friends. Obviously, you have to keep in mind the sovereignty and the continuity and resiliency, right? For example, if you are running a financial database, it's not actually going to be an option to replicate your information in a different country. Sovereignty will play an important role in there. If you have personal or corporate information in, in the European Union, GDPR for sure won't let you go outside of the European Union as data residents. So what I'm saying here, folks, is that in case of any scenario of disaster, you can use a site recovery to save it, to keep it back online. You have an approach and a best practice in here that it's testing the data recovery. Try to use site recovery tests in not daily basis, but as often as possible to secure that your workloads are protected. If we go back here and instead of a backup, we click, let's go back and you can see on the top, well, it's also here on the getting started, but you can see site recovery. I can enable site recovery. You can see here virtual machines or Vengbar to Azure, Hyper-V to Azure or on-prem solutions that we may have on a different service. I can go and say Azure to Azure, enable replication, administrate my plans, define a service level agreement of recovery, select the regions, the periodicity, the testing scenarios, and make it work completely as a continuity solution. I go here for replication, you select the locations, here, different options, the virtual machines that you will include, and we're good. So I can go here and say resource manager, this region, two zones, give me two zones. Remember the zones when we talk about computing, folks, we're given here the chance of using multiple data centers. You can see my computer is on the East US. So given that, I cannot create my computer on the same region because it won't be a disaster recovery plan. I could try to look for something different. I think I have one in South Central. Confirm here. South Central. No, it's not there yet. I need to configure. Well, it's 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 the allocated. But the idea is that if you have a computer on the same region where you are executing the disaster recovery, you move to a different region. So you replicate in an actual continuity region and not on the same that it's compromised. After we have this, we have a few settings where we can configure the periodicity, the checks, and the plan. We're good to go, we save, and our complete solution is now ready to be used. That's the objective, folks, of the site recovery object. To wrap it up, some scenarios that we have. So as you can see, folks, we can replicate VMs to VMs within different regions, one region to a different region. We can replicate on-prem VMs, Hyper-V, VMware, physical servers with Windows and Linux, stack using Azure into an Azure region. We can replicate AWS Windows computers into Azure. And we can replicate on-prem, administrate and via Microsoft Azure to another on-prem technology and use them as the source. What's happening here? It's that we are centralizing the whole management of backups for services around the Azure solution of the recovery center. And this, my friends, it's our final topic of the module. We have complete our backup and monitoring module, folks. Hey, Mr. Arturo Hamilton, I really hope you appreciate and enjoy the time. I actually had a good time with this model because I think monitoring is really important. So I hope you feel the same. And nothing left to say in here. I will love to see you the next time in our next type of. Thank you again and have a great day.